So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Darren Clark. I'm the manager of the Nature Partnership, and we're really pleased to bring this event as one of the Waterline Summit Fringe events. And it's great to see that so many people have booked and so many are here already to join us this afternoon. The theme of this year's Humber Conference is Nature's Recovery and Climate Change. And with some fantastic speakers and a very busy agenda this afternoon, so I'm going to hand straight over to our chair, Paul Leroy from Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust, who's going to guide us through the programme today. Over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Darren. And yes, a warm welcome to everybody. Um, appreciate this isn't the normal way we do our Humber Nature Partnership uh, conferences. It's normally a great opportunity to all get together, uh, meet, share ideas, catch up after a busy period of time. But uh, clearly uh, not uh, the best way of doing a conference this year. We're very pleased to be part of the the waterline series of, uh, of, of events going on and we do hope in 2022 to all be back together again um, so welcome to people that are regulars for the conference and uh, welcome to some new uh, faces really appreciate it we've got a mix of presentations um, some shorter ones and some longer ones uh, to stimulate some questions come on to that in a moment um, and we you know hope you'll uh, engage with this uh, not only today but uh, going forward and of course contact us or the other speakers if uh, it starts some questions from you. Um, 2020 and 2021 like uh, most people most organizations have been very difficult um, and that's uh, been exactly the same for us at the Humber Nature Partnership. Uh, really very impressed with the, the staff and the whole team that have taken us through that difficult period. Example Jackson uh, who joined us uh, only a few months before uh, lockdown thrown himself into his role of the Humber Management Scheme, real inroads into the um, work on disturbance from recreational activities, um, which has been really critical uh, area of work, as many of you will appreciate the high level of pressure on local environment uh, in the last year or so, and it's been uh, continuing to increase. Earlier this year, we launched the Barton to Barrow Clay Pits Trail uh, with support from Wren Kitchens, Barrow Parish Council and local landowners and managers. Um, so if you're visiting uh, the Barton area, call in at Water's Edge and pick up the, the trail leaflet. Volunteers continue to play a, a, an important role, significant role in our work, uh, working with the Humber Conservation Volunteers to deliver practical habitat management tasks on industry-owned land, working with uh, Keep Britain Tidy, uh, river care groups, uh, clearing litter from problem areas around the estuary. Also had planning work uh, continued by the Humber Nature Partnership, uh, discussions around a number of large-scale industrial developments to ensure the natural environment is properly considered, uh, becoming increasingly important in the next few years, I'm sure. And the advent, advent of biodiversity net gain um, going to be um, uh, something working alongside incre incredibly important low-carbon development proposals in the area. And um, we'll be hearing some of that uh, shortly this afternoon. Uh, so finally, a, a change in, in the team. Um, Gordon Kell, uh, left us in March uh, of this year. I will wish him a long uh, retirement, but also an opportunity for me as uh, chair of the board of Humber Nature Partnership to thank Darren, uh, Alan and Jackson, a uh, great team uh, working for you on the, on the Humber. Just a couple of practical points of, of housekeeping. Um, there's a Q&A session, so please use the uh, facility on the, on the Zoom uh, and uh, we'll be picking a collection of those questions at the, the very end. Appreciate not all of our speakers can uh, wait to the end. If we do get opportunity for any specific questions, particularly thinking of Craig here, uh, we may be able to take one or two questions then, but if not, we can catch up later. We've got a short break uh, at three, just after three, um, and uh, the event is being recorded and eventually we'll see that on the Humber Nature Partnerships YouTube channel. If you're tweeting, please use hashtag HNP2021. It'd be great to uh, uh, see that uh, going out uh, this afternoon. And um, finally, just again, really appreciate you joining us. And a little note to our speakers, uh, please be good to me. Uh, Timekeeping remotely is quite difficult. So uh, appreciate you checking your time uh, and try and keep us tight. I uh, haven't got a, a little bell, but I'm sure there's a button somewhere for. Uh, muting you or something if I need to but um, please uh, try and keep your time but really looking forward to this afternoon uh, thank you for joining us I'll um, hand over to Craig Bennett my colleague from the Wildlife Trusts Craig started as Chief Exec of the Wildlife Trusts 
on uh, the 1st of April 2020, um, quite a significant day uh, with the lockdown well underway by that point. Um, ambition for putting a third of the UK's land and sea into nature's recovery by 2030. He was previously chief executive of Friends of the Earth, where he refocused the organisation on its unique role of empowering communities to take action to climb to tackle the climate and ecological crisis. I won't go through his uh, long and impressive CV, um, but just to say he made it to uh, the Guardian's um, top environmental campaigners, described as a very model of a modern eco-general. I'm sure there's a little tune that comes out of that, but uh, without further ado, uh, over to you, Craig. Thank you. Well, Paul, thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak at this uh, gathering of the Humber Nature Partnership this afternoon. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to join you in this way. I kind of quite like the idea at first that it would be an excuse for a trip up um, to your part of the world. I'm, I'm in Cambridge at the moment and uh, I've managed to trip up to Spurn earlier this year. And I thought I'd get another trip up to the Humber, but then of course I discovered, like everything else at the moment, it's online meeting, but it does make it a bit easier to join. But I hope it's not too long before I find myself in, in and around the Humber again. Um, in two weeks from today, however, I'll be at COP26. I'll be up in Glasgow uh, for the COP26 meeting, which, despite it being delayed by over a year from when it was originally going to take place, nonetheless seems to be coming up very quickly for everyone. And that will be, of course, a critical meeting, a critical gathering of uh, world leaders and governments to discuss the climate crisis. But you know, what I think has become a clear phrase that we're all very used to over the last two, three years is that we are in, yes, a climate emergency, but also an ecological emergency. These phrases that now sounded a bit perhaps shrill a few years ago, but now are being repeated by world leaders and scientists time and again. And I think for me, it's really important that we do all the time think about how there's those two elements of this, the climate emergency and the ecological emergency, because they are often talked about as if they're separate issues, but in so many ways they are inextricably linked. We can't hope to solve one without solving the other. We can't hope to tackle runaway climate change unless we can put nature in recovery uh, so that nature can do its job of uh, helping us uh, sequest carbon and deal with extreme weather events and actually put the climate into recovery. We can't hope to put nature in recovery and deal with the appalling losses in species and the abundance of species and habitats that we've seen over the last few decades unless we tackle runaway climate change. We have to do both together. And uh, we crucially, of course, have to do that at the global level. I mean, everything I've just said is true globally. You know, actually the climate and nature are inextricably linked and the fact that we have uh, uh, fossil fuel emissions and parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere growing all the time. Actually, the only way to tackle that historically has been when you see uh, uh, the flush of uh, nature in recovery. We have to do that globally, but we also have to do it locally as well because uh, for every region in the world, every country in the world, every region, uh, every um, catchment uh, in uh, the world, we have to be able to put in nature into recovery. Uh, so uh, both so that we can repair nature and repair the job it does for us, but crucially also in tackling climate change that it can help mitigate climate change, but also adapt to it. And the thing I really wanted to share my thoughts with you on this afternoon is that when you look at the Humber estuary, you know, you have got it all really in the Humber estuary for answering all these aspects of the climate and ecological emergency. It is quite extraordinary when you think how rich the Humber estuary is in terms of the options it has in front of itself across the whole story of tackling climate and uh, ecological concerns. I mean, if we start with, of course, the economy and the industry you have in the Humber estuary, I mean, if you look at just the report, uh, the strategy that was published by the government earlier this week for the net zero strategy, and I can pick holes in it and talk about uh, what's missing from it. But actual fact, of course, it's still very welcome that you have a government producing a net zero strategy and pointing at some of the areas we've got to put a lot more effort in as a national economy in the future. And so many of them are very relevant to the Humber estuary and to the economy of your region. Um, 
often when people think about Humber and they think about Hull, they would think about offshore wind. And I'll come to that in a moment. That's very important. But I know that your region is also a very important area for manufacturing of energy efficiency technologies and insulation and so on. And of course, that's where we should always start in trying to uh, stop or reduce carbon emissions. Absolute first and foremost, we have to make sure that our homes and businesses are well insulated. There's been a lot of attention in this last week around heat pumps. And I know, again, some of those are being manufactured, I think, in your region. Um, but actually, heat pumps only really work when you have well insulated houses. So the insulation is crucially important and it's a big part already, significant already of the local economy. Uh, but I hope uh, there's opportunities for it to grow further in the future. So that combination of insulation, energy efficiency technologies, smart technologies around uh, energy efficiency and uh, wise use of energy in, in the home and in business, huge opportunities there in your region, but also, of course, how that links to, for example, the uh, generation of renewable en energy. And of course, offshore wind has been such a boost in terms of the uh, jobs for Hull and other parts of the Humber estuary. Um, there's a thing to say about offshore wind, but the Wildlife Trust, we do support the growth of offshore wind uh, because it is uh, so important that we're able to generate electricity in the future from uh, the wind and uh, as well as from the sun and the waves and so on and other forms of renewables. Uh, we do think at the Wildlife Trust that offshore wind has to be planned carefully uh, to make sure that it doesn't have negative impacts on nature. You know, when offshore wind uh, could be done badly and without uh, a strategic approach, there's a problem there that you will see lots of uh, interconnectors and lots of uh, cabling across the seabed where actually that could be done uh, more efficiently, uh, causing less disruption to um, the, uh, um, the, the, the ground, uh, to, the, to the, sea, the surface of the sea and so on. And that's really, really um, important that we get that right. But we do see at the Wildlife Trust that offshore wind has that very important role to play in helping the UK get to net, net zero if done right. Also, we've seen it being flagged in the UK government's net zero strategy this week, a role for CCS and of course hydrogen. And again, that's very important uh, for in the Humber, uh, Humber estuary region as well. So there's lots of opportunities there uh, for Humber, as you will all know, about creating those jobs, sustainable jobs, uh, for the region in the long term. And we often hear, so the debate, the debate's been turning up a little bit recently in the politics about peace, some parts of the political uh, agenda sort of raising issues around the costs of going to net zero. What I always say is a very important thing for us to reflect on is, well, what about the costs of not achieving net zero? The costs of not achieving net zero for all of us will be far greater than the costs of achieving it. And again, uh, of course, we know that it was only a few years ago that Hull suffered appalling flooding, which devastated people's lives, devastated people's property. Uh, if you follow the Humber further up uh, stream, of course, uh, if you go down up one tributary, the, uh, you get to York, which also suffered huge flooding uh, just a few years ago. We should never forget just the appalling impact that flooding can have on people's lives and livelihoods. And sadly, with runaway climate change, we will see more and more of that. And so the real costs, the real costs of not tackling climate change are always far greater than any of the costs associated, I would suggest, with the steps we need to put in place to make sure we are tackling climate change and cutting our emissions. And secondly, what I think is also very important is, of course, if we are investing in these industries, whether it be energy efficiency, or um, offshore wind or uh, renewable energies and so on or hydrogen, those are sustainable jobs for the future. Um, we would of course want to invest in industries which are the future rather than the industries that are the past. So that's very important. So as far as the economy's gossip for Humber, you know, you've got it all really in everything I've just talked about there, a bright future uh, as we and the world hopefully move to net zero. But the other thing, the other part of the equation is, of course, across the Humber region, as you'll know, through the Humber Nature Partnership, you know, you have it all really in terms of the options of nature and particularly the options for nature based solutions to climate change. You know, it's amazing over the last few years, we've heard a lot about the role that trees can play in helping 
uh, tackle climate change and there are obviously big targets for planting trees and of course it's absolutely right that we should celebrate uh, the role that trees and woodland can play in that they are hugely important we at the wildlife trust would always say that we would prefer to have a preference for natural regeneration of our woodlands because then you get the undergrowth with it you get the soil carbon that goes with it you get definitely get right tree right place when you let nature do it rather than necessarily uh, us as individuals or always plant trees not to say that there's not a role for tree planting as well but i think we need to see a much greater role for natural regeneration in creating new woodlands in this country and that's something we think is important but you know beyond woodlands uh, the wildlife trust we also think there needs to be a big spotlight on the role that other habitats can play in helping us tackle uh, the both uh, climate change in terms of mitigation and adaptation to it and i have to say right from the outset start talking about peatlands we know that peatlands are an incredibly important habitat uh, the the prince of wales has described uk peatlands as the U as the uk's tropical rainforest the equivalent of tropical rainforests and uk peatland soils in total store around 3.2 billion tons of carbon but sadly, around 80% of them are in a degraded state, releasing the equivalent of 23 million tonnes of carbon uh, every year. And that's a real problem. We have to turn that around and put our peatlands into recovery. And at the moment, even with uh, the extra cash that was announced from government this week for peatland regeneration, um, it's not enough uh, to, to get to the place where we need to see all peatlands in recovery. But I did want to mention peatlands because 20 years ago, uh, I spent a lot of time campaigning to get protection for Thorn and Hatfield Moors, uh, which of course is a real jewel in the crown in your broader region across the, the Humber estuary. And the fact that those were lowland raised peat bogs that once had that dome of peat before, of course, uh, so much of that peat was lost for horticulture. Um, those were prized, prized, prized habitats. And it's wonderful that now that they are being put into recovery, and it just shows it's yet another example in your region about those kind of nature based solutions that can play that role of if we can get those uh, Thorn Hatfield Moors. I went there just a couple of years ago to Hatfield Moors and saw that already there's Fagnum Moss growing on what was once bare peat. Uh, when we can get those into a good state, then they are then sucking carbon out of the air, uh, holding the water back in the landscape as peat bog should do, and providing one of those crucial nature based solutions to climate change. But as if that's not enough, of course, in the Humber region, you also have the other two sort of jaws in the crown of nature-based solutions, which are salt marsh and sea grasses. Uh, salt marsh, it's been estimated that a hectare of salt marsh can capture two tonnes of carbon a year, or uh, indeed a lot, lot more. And I think so far the role that salt marshes can play in helping uh, sequester carbon has been underplayed. And I think we'll come to uh, learn a lot more about that in the years ahead. And then also seagrasses, uh, uh, one of the most productive habitats, and they can have been uh, incredibly effective also at drawing carbon down. And, and of course, also very important for nursery habitats for fish populations. So um, and I, when I went to uh, Spurn Point just uh, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, I saw there the start of a seagrass restoration project by Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, which was really inspiring to see that that's taking place and that there are so many efforts now to try and re-establish seagrass habitat, not least in the Humber estuary, all very important. I talked about how seagrass, of course, is a very important nursery habitat for fish. And again, one of the na nature-based solutions that's often overlooked is the sheer abundance of species or what you might call biomass carbon. You know, actually, given that 41% of our wildlife species have declined in abundance since the early 1970s, that's actually a lot of carbon that used to be in the biosphere that's now predominantly in the atmosphere. And perhaps one of the most significant fluxes of carbon from the biosphere to the atmosphere over the last 100 years or so has been declining fish populations. You know, it's been estimated time and again that if we, if we actually we can try and get our fish populations uh, increasing year on year, decade on decade. Uh, and even if we could get them back to half something like historic levels, that would represent in itself a huge carbon store. And so again, if we go further out from the Humber estuary, but think about the wider impact of your region there, 
there's huge opportunities there uh, across all of this area to try and really shine a light on uh, nature-based solutions to climate change. So as I said, really to my mind, in so many ways, the Humber estuary has got it all. But there's a final few points to say in all of this, and that is also the role of people in that and the connection between nature and people. Because I would say that it's not just nature we have to put into recovery, we have to put the relationship between people and nature into recovery as well. And I was very pleased when I was looking at uh, your website for the Humber Nature Partnership, I could see there a number of projects that are about just that, whether it's from signage or from about the projects around creating uh, recreation areas in and around the Humber estuary, making sure that people living uh, around the Humber have those opportunities to connect to nature close to where they live. We've learned so much that this is incredibly important for people's health and well-being. And my goodness, we've really seen that over this last year or so during the pandemic, when perhaps more than ever before, people have felt that need for their daily dose of nature and to connect to nature on a regular basis to make sure uh, that they are, are looking after their health and well-being. At the Wildlife Trust, we saw a 3,000% increase in the number of people visiting our, our webcams from our nature reserves in just the first two, three months of the pandemic last year. And we've seen huge increases in people visiting our reserves as well during this period. And sometimes Wildlife Trust members themselves actually discovering reserves on their doorstep that they didn't know existed as they discover the importance of local nature rather than necessarily thinking that you have to travel a long distance to visit uh, good nature areas and so on. And so actually celebrating, discovering, celebrating, uh, getting to learn more about nature close to where you with, live is incredibly important and is a huge kind of investment in future generations as well, in providing, in making sure that as we can invest, as we can invest in new industry, as we can invest in new development, if at the same time we can create new space for nature that provides those nature-based solutions, yes, for tackling climate change, yes, for adapting for climate change, but also helping putting the relationship between people and nature into recovery as well. That are with the ultimate win-win, win-win, win-win. And all the opportunities are there uh, for that to happen, I think, in and around the Humber estuary. So it's really exciting. But if you look at all those different components of what we were talking about there, there's one other magic thing that is very important to make that happen, and that is partnerships. You know, no one organisation could do uh, anything like uh, all the things I was just talking about. It will take really strong partnership working between many organisations to make that happen, to realise that vision about how you can take something like the Humber Estuary and provide all those win-win-wins right across there for people, for nature, for the climate, for the economy, for jobs, for sustainability long term. That's how we can deliver all those and do it through partnership. So I really hope you have a fantastic conference today with the Humber Nature Partnership and that you are, you are able to keep moving forward to delivering such a rich vision for the future. Thank you very much.